Thank you so much. Wow. What a glowing introduction. Thank you. I didn't see all that coming. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. And I, oh, I better put my watch down because I've got a time box. This Cardinal Turkson has to go on at 11. That's what I'm told. I will accept sign language, like wrap it up sign language. And I will do my best now in the remaining time to do what I've got to do. So uh, there's a lot coming your way. Put on your seat belts. Welcome. The conservative solution to the climate crisis is the title that I put together for this talk. Uh, there's a reason why I did that. First, a little bit more about my background. Yes, my name is Greg Hamra, and I can be easily found. I can't go underground, I'm all over the web, but hamra.net. And my background, I, I did teach at the Intensive Language Institute, the University of Miami, when I moved back from India with my wife in 2008. We lived there for four years. And we just got back last week. Again, we went for a trip of a lifetime, really, and we were two weeks in India. Uh, two weeks in Philippines and uh, several days in Qatar. It was quite a trip. Uh, so my, I, I wear a lot of hats, and, and, and Lisa was nice enough to mention the Hammer Group. I didn't know she was going to mention that. And I, I sort of, I, 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 I use that to represent sort of the group of hats that I wear. I am with the University of Miami, but no longer with the Intensive Language Institute, but in fact with the School of Architor Architorture. <laughs> Um, I teach a, a course there called Sustainability and the Built Environment. Um, I'm also with the U.S. Green Building Council as a volunteer. This is a non-profit organization and Citizens Climate Lobby. Also, I'm involved with the Clio Institute, and I have the Clio Institute to thank for my being here because Father Chaffee was given my name by Carolyn Caroline Lewis at the Clio Institute. So I'm glad that he called, and here I am because of uh, the Clio Institute recommending me. And I'm also involved with an organization called Everblue that's a for-profit company, veteran-founded company, uh, that does green building education. And that's where I really began my, my uh, career in green building education, teaching LEED. I took a LEED class, they hired me, here I am. I don't work as much with Everblue anymore, but the University of Miami hired me and I, I do some work on my own. So I'm still uh, affiliated with them, I'm their senior LEED educator, and. They, they, I, I guess the best way to, to describe our relationship, it's, it's amenable, although they're not deploying me because I asked them not to, but uh, to summarize my manager at the time, uh, who, who perfectly summarized the relationship I was trying to describe, she said, married but separate bedrooms. Okay. They, they wrote an article about me a few months ago, I recommend them, and, but I'm just not being deployed by them. Um, so, goals for today. Some takeaways. You're going to understand the balance between ecological, social, and financial goals. There are a lot of goals that organizations pursue, individuals pursue, and oftentimes to the exclusion of the other. Oftentimes businesses pursue money, profit, and don't focus on social or ecological performance, and this is very important. Uh, meet some of the climate policy thought leaders uh, through the Advent of technology, my computer and the internet. You're going to learn and hear from some other people. So I'll be playing VJ a little bit. I'll be playing some video for you a bit. Uh, I want to move past the ifs. In fact, at the very end, uh, Dr. Chaffee here mentioned if, 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 and a lot of ifs. And yesterday we heard a lot of ifs. Dr. Chris Langdon, if we were to reduce emissions to this level, then we might be able to reduce the most uh, painful impacts of climate change, if this and if that. Uh, you missed an excellent presentation by uh, Dr. Richard Muller yesterday, who said if we can uh, get China to adopt uh, energy efficiency and get them to reduce emissions, then maybe we'll tackle this too. There are a lot of ifs out there. Today I'm going to take you past the ifs into some of the hows and try to put you in touch to helping to drive that. And I mean that, even for the high school kids in this room, to become part of this very crucial movement because this issue is so big, so crucial, that we need an all hands on deck approach to this. Very quickly, hands up. Who knows, who's heard of conflict minerals? Just, okay, maybe 10 people, maybe 11. Who's heard of uh, Pope Francis? <laughs> That's checking to see if your arms work. That, usually I put Dancing with the Stars up there. I threw in, I swapped it out for Pope Francis last night. Who's heard of USGBC? Okay. How about LEED? Uh, more hands for LEED. See, LEED is a bigger brand. LEED is the biggest brand in the world of sustainability. 
fact, LEED is oftentimes used to describe things as green that can't be LEED certified. <laughs> like, here's a LEED certified water bottle. No, can't be LEED certified. Or here's a LEED certified person. No, I, I'd have to turn into a building first. Buildings and spaces are LEED certified. Uh, it, and it comes from the USGBC, the US Green Building Council. So the USGBC is the organization, and LEED is a rating system. Who's heard of this? CO2E. Three people, I'm saying. OK. We're not going to necessarily go into all of these. How about this thing? Triple bottom line. I alluded to it moments ago. OK, you're going to learn a little bit more about that. How about this concept? The tragedy of the commons. More hands on tragedy of the commons. And who knows that that's the name of an article that was written in 1968 in the journal Science. Very good. How about this guy? His name came up a few times yesterday. He's known as the father of climate science. He's arguably the most famous climate scientist in the world. Dr. James Hansen. Good. I'm glad that a few hands went up for that. How about this guy? Secretary George Shultz? Republican icon. Reagan's. President Reagan. Secretary of State. Secretary of the Treasury. Secretary of Labor. Uh, uh, in fact, Fred Krepp referred to uh, the head of EDF, the head of the Environmental Defense Fund, when I asked him a question a few months ago, referred to him as Reagan's Secretary of Everything. I bring him up for a moment because he's one of the thought leaders that I'm going to be introducing you to. Am I talking fast enough? Good. How about this last one? Okay. Let, all right. There's, that's up there for a few reasons as well. I never thought I'd be flying the flag for Milton Friedman. But in fact, I am in some ways. So first of all, green building. Uh, yesterday, Richard Muller did mention that efficiency is one of the uh, very important uh, cogs to the solution, and I wholeheartedly agree with this. Efficiency in our buildings, efficiency in our vehicles, efficiency in our personal lives, very, very, very important. I've devoted my life to training thousands of professionals from five continents, thousands in South Florida alone, in green building standards, specifically LEED. These are many green building standards out there. LEED is the big one. There are LEED certified buildings in about 150 countries, over 4 billion square feet of certified space, over 1.5 million per day certified. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on LEED, except to explain that it's not pronounced LEEDS. That's a city in England. This is a LEEDS building. And I first heard of LEEDS when an album by The Who came out called Live at LEEDS. Who remembers that? Hands up. About a few guys with the white hair in the room, and that's about it. This is, LEEDS is not what LEED is. <laughs> LEED is a green building standard, leadership in energy and environmental design, and there would be a LEED building the American Airlines Arena, which got recertified last year uh, for operations and maintenance. Empire State Building is LEED certified. Many office buildings, University of Miami has a lot of buildings that are LEED certified, FIU, very strong initiative on LEED certifying their buildings. Homes can be LEED certified. Office spaces can be LEED certified. We have three choices, ladies and gentlemen. We basically have three choices to reduce our emissions, prepare for a changing climate, and suffer. We're really going to do some of each. And the question is, what mix is it going to be? The more mitigation we do, the less adaptation will be required. And the less suffering there will be. But we got uh, very real yesterday. We heard some questions from, in fact, a young lady, a high school student, uh, asked a, a question about, you know, are we really screwed? You know, Not her language exactly, but um, she got it. And then, to my surprise, Father Chaffee actually mentioned the fact that we are undergoing the sixth great extinction. Who's familiar with the concept that we've had five extinctions and that we are in fact witnessing with our naked steaming eyes the unfolding of the sixth great extinction? We're watching it happen. Half of the species kicked off the planet, one species taking over. So, a moment of science. Who can tell me how old is our planet? Not the geology guy or the oceanographer guy. Anybody else? Go ahead, John. Dr. Van Leer. 4.7 million years. Ah, see, it's hard to wrap your, he said million and he said billion. He's in the ballpark there, 4.6, 4.7. Wrapping your mind around a number like that is difficult. And so let's put it into perspective. If we take those billions of years, 4.6, and we tur turn it into just years, 46 years, that means humans have been here four hours. I, want I think perspective is very important. It's, it's important in timelines, and this is a timeline. 
Uh, the Industrial Revolution began about a minute ago. And we've destroyed about half of our world's forests. Nice job. I didn't take that picture, but that's what Manhattan would look like if they were halfway built up. So about half of the uh, Earth's forests gone. We have overstepped the Earth's carrying capacity. And we're doing so with gusto. We do need to scale back. There's a, uh, a, a framework called the uh, Planetary Boundaries Framework. And uh, you can look into this later on if you want to, but we're way off the mark when it comes to uh, eutrophication or aquatic health. Um, and also climate change is, is in there, but it's not the worst. So biodiversity loss and um, you, uh, excess nutrients in water bodies. We are destroying water bodies, fresh water bodies, salt water bodies. And you can look into this if you want to see uh, uh, just one of the many frameworks that uh, addresses how are we, the hand of man, affecting the planet that we live on. Um, so what's the problem? Well, when you try, we, we're finding that we're really connected. <laughs> more connected to the living world around us than we thought. And when you try to pick anything out by itself, we find that it's hitched to everything else in the universe. In Pope Francis's encyclical, uh, I, I look through different quotes with the help of a, uh, another professional that I'm in touch with. I'll introduce you to him. Um, paragraph 163, the, prof the profoundly human causes of environmental degradation. I used to... I used to uh, pussyfoot away from saying in my, in my lead green building classes, the words global warming or climate change. People would get freaked out. I used to say global weirding and climate chaos. So what it is, the hots are hotter, the colds are colder, storms are stronger and more prevalent, droughts are intense. And I've moved back into saying human caused global warming. Global warming is not climate change. Global warming causes climate change. Global warming causes uh, molecules to expand also, and the seas get bigger. The sea getting bigger is not climate change, although they're also wrapped up. But global warming triggers climate change, global warming triggers other... In fact, CO2 pollution does, as a heat-trapping gas, exacerbate global warming, but it also, as we learned yesterday, is changing the chemistry of the oceans. That's not climate change, and I get a little tweaked when scientists or regular people call that climate change. That's not climate change. Changing the chemistry of the oceans is not climate. It's an effect of CO2 pollution because the CO2 turns to high school students. Does anybody know what it turns to in the ocean? No? Carbonic acid. Right? It's changing the chemistry of the oceans and making it harder for uh, shellfish and corals to regenerate. Um, let me blank, blank this out for a second and, and explain what this is about. Many people complain that the scientific community uses language and projections that are alarmist. Some have, for sure, no question. People exaggerate left and right, and I've heard exaggerations. But overall, the observable effects on our planet are not even meeting the conservative estimates that we've seen from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, and many other projections. A friend of mine did a, a Google search for the phrase faster than previously thought. And we're seeing that the pace of ice melt and sea level rise is in fact outswamping projections. So the scientific community overall has been very conservative in its estimates. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. They left out of the IPCC the melting tundra that Dr. Uh, Van Leer mentioned yesterday, and there's going to be methane released from tundra because they didn't know how to model it, so they left it out. They left out Antarctic ice melt because they didn't know how to model it, so they left it out. <laughs> so automatically, we have a lot of extra effects built into the reality that may not be in the projections. When you build a bridge as a civil engineer, you take risk and then you multiply by 10 and you try to really avoid those risks. And it seems that many climate scientists look at the models, their, their data, and then they cut it in half because they don't want to be branded as extremists and alarmists. And what we're seeing is the reality is out swamping many of the projections. And here we are. I, wasn't going to bring this up, but it's facts. It was brought up yesterday. I felt I had license to, to get into some serious stuff here. This is the book, The Sixth Extinction, by Elizabeth Colbert. I saw her speak recently, and I've been following her for some time. 
And this goes hand in hand with a paragraph from the Pope's encyclical, and I will read it aloud. Doomsday predictions can no longer be met with irony or disdain. We may well be leaving our coming generations debris, desolation, and filth. The pace of consumption, waste, and environmental change has so stretched the planet's capacity that our contemporary lifestyle for stuff, unsustainable as it is, can only precipitate cat uh, catastrophes such as those which even now periodically occur in different areas of the world. It's underway. Um, a professional in the world of corporate sustainability, education, advocacy, he's a writer for HBR, Harvard Business Review, is Andrew Winston. Uh, on his website, he picked apart the encyclical and created a word cloud. I, you, know, you know, Pope Francis is winning over all kinds of people. Uh, people who may not follow his faith, but he is winning over all kinds of fans for a lot of good reasons. And, and, and the, I, I think the fact that he's building bridges and creating a community of humans is, is what he's doing. And in fact, just yesterday, did you hear about the tiff with Trump? <laughs> right? Trump is trying to build walls. Pope Francis is trying to build bridges, which is what we need to do. We need to reach out to other people and other, other people with whom you may not agree on everything. But the only way that we're going to get through this, this, is an, this requires an all-hands-on-deck approach. This issue is so big that we need everybody on deck. I don't mean people that I may politically disagree with. The word cloud that uh, he created, he looked into the words, the language in the encyclical. Top 50 words uh, of the document, God appears frequently with a third of the mentions later on, but human is the top word. How about that? Is that interesting? Other biggies, world, all, life, nature, and environment. Oh, and social. Jesus is in there too, but not as much as the other stuff. Talk about building a bridge to everybody. Hmm? All right, I mentioned the triple bottom line and balancing ecological, environmental, and what's the other E? I always forget. It's the money one, economic. <laughs> uh, the triple bottom line can be easily memorized as people, planet, and profit. And organizations that follow all three and make this the foundation of the way they make their decisions are those corporations and organizations that are outperforming their competition. This is the foundation of corporate sustainability initiatives and the, in the decision-making process. Those companies that look at their people, not only their own employees, but their supply chain and their customers and the environment are companies that are, in fact, outperforming their competition. And this is the triple bottom line. This is the bedrock of really not just corporate sustainability, but responsible decisions made in the world today. We do need to worry about the money side. If you're a tree-hugging NGO who wants to save the planet and save the people, and you can't keep your lights running and your internet goes out, <laughs> you're out of business. You don't get to do your work. You have to have your finance in, finances in order. You need to have financial performance and companies that have financial performance and good social performance and good environmental performance are those companies that are in fact not just looked upon with greater praise by customers and the world, but in fact they are outperforming their competition. The triple bottom line, you can look it up later on. I found that on the Everblue website. And you can learn more about what this means, but look up TBL, triple bottom line. These are the three pillars of sustainability. Now I want to put things in, in perspective here. Remember the Venn diagram Dr. Chaffee mentioned? Does this qualify as a Venn diagram? I believe it is. This puts them on equal footing. And I don't think that's accurate. I want to put this in perspective and sequence these for you briefly to add a little bit more perspective. Remember, perspective matters. Some people think that people and society and nature are subsets of the economy. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm constantly reminded of a local mayor who has come much further than when we first met him, came to our house, and my wife put him on the spot. What are you going to do about environmental sustainability and doing things right in our city without naming names. And he said, well, you know, that stuff's expensive and we have to get our uh, uh, finances in order first. 
Okay, I mean, you do have to have money to get things done sometimes, that's very pragmatic. But to put it, to, to, to make everything that you do right a subset of economy means that we're off the mark a bit. Um, I don't know of an economy that exists outside of society, do you? It's a subset of society, you see? So people who think like this, I think, are thinking very, it's a twisted thinking, it's very bass backwards. it's self-serving, it's very arrogant, and in fact, it's suicidal. Some people put nature under people, as if there's people and then here's everything else on a plate for you to consume. And I think this is also dangerous when we are an integral part of nature. Now, like I said before, I don't know of an economy that exists outside of a society. It's a subset of society, just like PTA meetings, culture, traffic reports, right? All that are subsets of society. They don't exist outside of society. You don't have society, you don't have an economy. Am I right? I don't know of a society that exists outside of nature. So financial capital matters. Human capital matters. You don't have financial capital without human capital. And we don't have any of it without natural capital. So from a corporate standpoint, a corporation that doesn't have water, they're out of business. Water is used in manufacturing. Water is used in staying alive, keeping your employees alive. You don't have energy, you're out of business. You don't have raw materials, you're out of business. We don't have food, we're out of business. <laughs> you don't have people, you're out of business. In fact, if sustainability isn't embedded into the DNA of your plan, profit making is the least of your worries. So we really need to rethink where do we exist on this planet? Where do we, where do we put our efforts and our attention? Yes, we need to live and have a good life, but we need to really uh, put things in perspective, I think. Uh, I just got back from India and uh, I, you know, Beijing is polluted, New Delhi is polluted. I've, I've heard, we see the reports about China, the air quality is lethal, lethal. They shut down the city, right? Crazy, in, in Shanghai and in Beijing. In Delhi, they don't shut down the city, they keep going, but let me tell you, it's lethal. You can smell it in the hallways of the hotel, upper floors, you can smell it as you're landing. You can smell New Delhi. It, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure what the latest metric is today, but from large particulate pollution, 2.5, uh, PM 2.5 particulate matter pollution, Delhi has been called for a long time the most polluted city on the planet. Um, and we just got back from there. It's like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. I took this photo the morning uh, we were in Delhi one full day, and I took that out the window in the morning. You know what smog is? Smoke plus fog. Right? A lot of this, what I was told last year when I was there, is that there are three sources, pre, three predominant sources. Coal burning power plants, vehicular emissions, and agricultural burning, and just people burning to stay warm, burning stuff. There's all kinds of very, and they'll burn plastic bags. <laughs> they'll collect wood and burn stuff. In fact, out the window, this is in the morning, there's somebody, a fire, just literally across the street, but I could barely see across the street. And there's a guy burning stuff to presumably stay warm. They're also burning garbage just to clean up. So I heard somebody smart, very smart say once, it's like a nature walk through the book of revelations. What we're seeing in the world in the last couple of days, uh, last couple of years. Um, sea level rise in South Florida, as measured by those uh, hippies down at the Naval Air Station in Key West is nine inches in the last hundred years. Has anybody heard that Miami is ground zero for the economic impacts of sea level rise? We have the greatest value of assets at risk in the world. We are number one, Miami. Number two is either Shanghai or Shenzhen, China, number two. New York is in the top 10. Miami is number one, welcome. We made it to the top of the list. Um, it's different in different parts of the world for a number of reasons. The Ocean currents flow different ways. There is land subsidence, there's land uplift. I'm gonna show it to you the first six seconds of a video here. Uh, I think, I, I call this sea level rise in action and uh, a good friend and colleague of mine shot this video. Check it out. You can see the water surging with the bay a few weeks, uh, a few steps away. This is sea level rise in action. This is, this is water coming up through the storm sewers into the streets. On a sunny day, if you look at the reflection, it's a beautiful blue sky sunny day, and the water is coming right into the streets. So this is sea level rise in action. The rest of it is, you see the puddling. Here, the salt water 
But the best part, I'll play it again, the first six seconds or seven seconds, you can see the surging of the water. You actually see it happening. And, and, and there are people in this world that don't think this is happening. They see the puddles, they think, oh, that's a water main break or it's a rain event. These are non-rain flooding events, uh, sunny day flooding, we call it. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, we do have to adapt. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Here's, that guy's adapting. <laughs> if you own this house and you're in the middle of a 30 year mortgage cycle, it's a scary situation. Same here. Ocean acidification, again, today's not the science day, it's the, it's the uh, policy and solutions time, but there are economic costs to this. And, and so what I'm trying to do is speak to the economic uh, angle in order to get people's attention and maybe get society and business leaders and thought leaders and municipal leaders, and the, the pillars of our community to make the necessary changes. And so when you look at, the, and this is 2007, when you look at the, the costs of ocean acidification on fisheries, it's in the billions. Um, we have winners and losers, I'll talk about that in a bit, but there is a huge economic loss to, to what we're doing. There are winners and losers. I'm gonna talk about some of the winners and losers. Losers, well, people in low-lying areas, somebody who has to get up and move house, move home from South Florida, or from South Beach. I know a lady, she's a climate refugee. You don't have to be a, you don't have to be a poor Bangladeshi to be a climate refugee. She's an affluent businesswoman, Mary Kay woman, and who studied the height elevation maps and moved to another, uh, bought a house in Miami Shores because she was sick and tired of the flooding in South Beach. And when she was interviewed by Al Jazeera, she said, I'm a climate refugee. Because I told her, you're a climate refugee. <laughs> Loser, right? But she's doing okay. Winners, no mirror jellyfish. The proliferation, they're, they're benefiting from the, the, the differing, uh, the chemistry, the lower pH. Um, Humboldt squid that are decimating herring stocks. The losers are the fishermen who are losing the money because they're competing with Humboldt squid. Mosquitoes, winners. Losers, the deer that they're killing because they're not dying off because of global warming. They're staying alive throughout the, the year. And who's affected? Not just the deer that are dying, but in New Hampshire, you have a, a whole community of B&Bs of where people would go on vacation to go and see the deer, but the deer are dying off and they're completely covered with ticks. Winners and losers. Pine bark beetles decimating thousands of acres in the western US, killing the trees and providing more fuel for very extreme fires, that coupled with drought, and lightning strikes and whatnot, and global warming, uh, is making things worse. And so pine bark beetles, winners, because they're not dying off, losers are the trees and those people that are maybe losing their homes because of the fires. A lot of winners and losers. There are a lot of costs involved in our energy choices. Those costs are not built into the price we pay. There is an inherent accounting problem and I'm here to show you how to fix it. There are costs involved in our energy choices that are not reflected in the price we pay, not just for our direct fuel, but for our embedded carbon-based stuff. There is fuel in manufacturing and delivering this if it was made in Japan or China. Or this, or this, or your iPhone. Not just the direct fuel, but the embedded carbon in the things that we consume, which is about two thirds of the carbon is in the stuff you consume that's not direct fuel, just FYI. There are costs involved. We have a bigger military, bigger than the next 25. This is a vicious cycle. We have a huge dependence on oil, makes us intervene in oil rich countries. We don't go into Darfur, but they're not sitting on a ton of oil. Bad things are happening, but we don't go in there which means we need a huge military, uh, biggest consumer in the nation, and it furthers our dependence on oil. So who's most affected? This is one of the big questions of the event, right? Who's really affected by this? I'm gonna show you a, a, an interesting little web page, and I'll read this from the encyclical, paragraph number 25, climate change, number 25. Climate change is a global problem with grave implications. Environmental, social, economic, that's triple bottom line, political and for the distribution of goods. It represents one of the principal ch challenges facing humanity in our day. Its worst impact will probably be felt, and it already is being felt, by developing countries in coming decades. Do you know Kiribati? They're looking for another country to set up shop, to set up a country. Same thing in the Maldives. They're losing the country because of sea level rise. Imagine that. 
Oh, we have been imagining it, but that's all we have to do so far in our near term. They're dealing with it worse. Yes, we're, the, we're ground zero, and I make it very clear uh, when I have to, especially when talking to my Bangladeshi friends and Indian friends for the economic impact. We are the economic ground zero, but a lot of places are getting it a lot worse than we are. A lot worse than we are. This, I'm not going to play it all, but you can look it up. Um, here's a website that shows. Who's most affected by various... Let me see if the audio works. I'll play a little bit of it. We're used to seeing the world like this. Though if countries are resized to represent their true area, it actually looks more like this. But area is only one way of looking at the world. This site gives some others, such as where the people are and where the money is. Mainly, though, this site is about climate change. Browse the responsibility maps to see how each country helps drive global carbon emissions, from extracting fossil fuels and burning them through to consuming the goods and services that result. You can also see historical emissions, most of which are still in the air, and potential emissions that are currently locked up in coal, oil and gas reserves. In addition, you'll find some vulnerability maps which show the people most at risk from climate change, such as those already exposed to droughts, floods and extreme temperatures. Click on a country to see its national data, and if you like, use the shading drop-down to overlay extra information. For his there you have it. If you want to look that up, look up Carbon Map on the Guardian website. Which countries are responsible for climate change? I find that very interesting. That kind of addresses the, uh, the question about who's most affected. Amid our attempts to feed science and shove more science down people's throats, people still don't get it. I think that this issue of belief in climate change is a, a, an irrational question. When somebody asks me, do I believe in climate change? I quote a former senator from South Carolina, very six, a six-term, very conservative Christian, Bob Inglis. It's not worthy of belief. It's just data. Belief is for the unobservable parts of our world, not the observable, measurable, predictable. You, can either, you either know about it or you don't. You either accept the data or you don't. But you can't believe or not believe in it. I just don't think that, may, that, that makes sense. You can try to make sense to people and say, well, here's what we need to do, even if it's a big hoax. This is a, uh, a word-winning cartoon for good reason. I'll leave it up there until I hear some chuckles and I move on. It's worth it. All right. This is politicians discover, uh, discussing climate change. I think we do need the help of policymakers. <laughs> We need business leaders, policymakers, and you, citizens. Our, here's the problem. Our leaders oftentimes don't lead. They follow. They follow what you tell them to do. And if you're sitting back and complaining and they don't hear you, they're following the people that's whispering in their ears. And sometimes the whispering in their ears involves more than whispering. See, ladies and gentlemen, we have a Coke problem in our country. You know what I mean? Um, there's a lot of money in politics, and you, you'll learn more about it if you look at the documentary film Merchants of Doubt. Has anybody seen the documentary film Merchants of Doubt? I just saw it Wednesday night, right before my Thursday thing. I saw it for the first time. I've wanted to see it for years, and I finally showed it. Uh, City of Pinecrest, uh, Pinecrest Gardens, and Cleo Institute hosted it, and I bought it. So, had to have it. I sometimes make the argument about what does it mean to be conservative? When you look at the amount of data that's available saying that this is real, in fact, if you have a, 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 a kid who's sick and you take him to 100 doctors, and 98 doctors say, yes, yeah, she needs this operation, she needs this operation, and two say, well, I'm not so sure. Going with the two is not the conservative choice. That means you're rolling with the dice. You're embracing huge risk. You don't get to call yourself conservative if you go with the two. You can choose that because it's a free country, right? But you don't get to call yourself conservative by taking the most risky of choices. But I don't get that far with this. I sometimes embrace humor and sarcasm. I, I love that. It makes me feel good. But that still doesn't move the needle. It makes me feel good. What moves the needle? Showing videos that uh, climate change has known about since well before I was born. I won't play it now, we don't have time. 
I sometimes make the economic case. Is it good for our economy? It is in the short run if you do not factor in the costs. If you ignore the costs, you externalize the costs from the price. And then we have a huge accounting error. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the biggest accounting error in the history of our species. And that's what I'm here to talk about very briefly because I'm being given the hook soon. Oh, I see, I have about 10 minutes. Does it factor in the cost of downwind emissions? Does it factor in the cost of early, uh, well, you heard Dr. Mueller yesterday, 4,400 deaths per day in China because of air pollution, particulate pollution. That's, that's, there's a cost involved that I don't think is built into the price I paid for this thing, assuming it was made in China. I just don't think it was factored into the price. It looks good if we ignore the very same quote-unquote free market economic principles that many people claim to espouse. See, here is the crux. You have a lot of people that consider themselves free market capitalists, yet they ignore the very same principles when it's convenient for them. When it happens to be their pollution, they're fine having society pay for that. Well, you don't get to call yourself a free market capitalist. You get to call yourself an unprincipled opportunist, fair weather socialist. <laughs> If I get to burden you with my costs and my pollution and make society pay for it, but I only get to reap the benefits and the, and the, and the profits, that does not make me a principled conservative. Just want you to think about that. Milton Friedman would not even uh, agree with the way that we're doing things, not building in the costs. Milton Friedman, for those of you who don't know, is a, 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 he's now deceased famous free market economist who embraces low taxes, less government intervention, and paying your full freight, pay your weight. You, you, he's a free market capitalist economist. You pay for the cost, you put in your sweat equity, you put in your brain power, you sell stuff, you make money, and you make a profit, and you deserve that profit, but you pay for the back end, and you don't just externalize the cost. So he would not approve of the way that we're handling our energy economy. Our energy economy, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing at all like a free market economy. And I'll explain why right now. What we have is big government, top-down, command and control regulations, billions in subsidies, what is it, 5.3 trillion, I'm sorry, in subsidies, and a complex game of energy subsidies and benefits. Maybe John Van Leer got an energy subsidy or some sort of a tax break for putting solar panels on his house and buying a Tesla. And Great, I like that, but it's very uneven. So what we have is the government picking winners and losers. Yeah, you get the star in your forehead for doing this and, and, and command and control regulations and you get, you get a ticket for doing that. Don't do this, do that. And frankly, that's expensive and inefficient. I think that we do need some things to be regulated. Very dangerous things need to be regulated. We need oversight for the protection of society. Ultimate freedom means I could get drunk and go drive my car. But no, society says, no, you don't have the freedom to do that because for the benefit of society, that's a freedom you're just not allowed to have. We've agreed as a society, you can't just get drunk and go drive your car. You can't get drunk or you could drive your car, just don't do it at the same time. We have protections in place for the benefit of society. We don't have a free for all. Cars are dangerous. Alcohol is potentially dangerous. Don't mix them. So, there are costs involved in our energy choices and we are not paying for it at the point of purchase. Oh, we're paying for it, but we're not seeing it in the price. And I'm here to suggest fixing the biggest accounting error in the history of the species. Now, some people might say, oh, it's capitalism is bad. Capitalism is bad. I do love this quote, but I don't completely agree. And I wasn't going to put this up, except I saw her book in the bookstore yesterday on campus here. Okay? And she says, climate change detonates the ideological scaffolding on which contemporary conservatism rests. There's simply no way to square a belief system that vilifies collective action and venerates total market freedom with a problem that demands collective action on an unprecedented scale and a dramatic reining in of the market forces that created and are deepening the crisis. Now, she's not wrong, but to say that we need to throw out capitalism is potentially dangerous. She may be right, she may be wrong, but look, like it or not, that's the game in play. 
I can sit on the sidelines and complain about it or get in the game and try to fix it. I'm in a fantasy land if I think I'm going to switch off capitalism and somehow magically switch on some other economic system. That's the biggest force in our world today. And unless you get in the game and try to fix it, you're not having any effect. You're living in a dreamland. Yes, it's frustrating when we see that we kill each other over oil. And it's frustrating when we see that all this other stuff is available. We have a market disparity. We have a, a, a monstrosity of market disparities where energy from hell is artificially cheap looking and energy from heaven looks expensive. And we need to even the playing field. I'm not gonna have time to play for you some audio and video from my friend Catherine Hayhoe. Uh, but the Pope has been speaking up and he's now being branded a liberal commie and sometimes even, I think I heard uh, the Trump people say this. Some people say, I mean, it's crazy. It, see, we, we, we live in a nation that's becoming increasingly tribal around this one issue of climate change. Um, yeah, I do, I'm gonna play you one section from Catherine, but you know, uh, people are really uh, sticking to uh, the way they believe, uh, uh, their, their beliefs about government and freedom, and they're even shunning Pope Francis. You know, I, I think we need a, a reset. Now, those lefties in the room, and I talk to a lot of lefties, they would like to make this a left-only issue. We are doomed if this is a left-only issue. We need to reach across the aisle. We need to talk to people that we do not ideologically agree on for everything and try to bring them to our side, or at least to the middle, to get them to understand the reality. The fact is Republicans are back to into a corner on this. As John said yesterday, it's the only major political party in the entire world that disputes what the rest of the scientific community knows very well. It's, it's utterly ridiculous, and it's suicidal. And so what do we at Citizens Climate Lobby do? They're back into a corner. It's very easy to poke them back into a corner, and you saw the memes I showed earlier. But what CCL or Citizens Climate Lobby is doing is giving them a seat at the table. And one way that I get their attention is I say to some hardcore Republicans, the train is leaving the station. Do you want liberals in charge? That gets their attention. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Here we are meeting on Capitol Hill. In fact, in the Capitol building, in between votes, John Van Leer is the back of John Van Leer's head and the side of Dr. Julie Lambert's head. <laughs> right there, meeting with Ileana Ross Layton, our 28 year senior congresswoman, Republican, who finally decided after a while and some pressing, I actually publicly outed the meeting and said, hey, look, she's going to get real on climate. She signed a resolution that CCL has put together, and we now have 13 co sponsors of, re of Republicans who have acknowledged climate change as human cause and have vowed to take congressional action. This is the work CCL has done. Capitalism can save the planet. I know this sounds ridiculous, but if we get it done right, and we do what Milton Friedman would do, and we pay for the cost side, we can fix the climate, I'm sorry, we can reduce the effects of climate and push back the worst effects of it in a way that does not kill the economy. I know I have to wrap up soon, but I have to say this. The biggest problem that we have is those people that are denying climate, they're not afraid of the science, they're afraid of the solutions. They think that anything that we might do to fix the climate must kill the economy. And they are wrong. And many very smart economists and thought leaders know this. We have to change the markets. Um, right now, here's where we are. Having talked in Paris about what we might do, but the fact is it was an utter failure because it was better than it could have been, much better than it could have been if you think of Copenhagen in 2009, which was a failure. But the fact is we have no binding agreements and we're just not going to get to our, uh, our, our two degree limit unless we do something economic, economically to change the economics of this. The reason why we are in this situation is because it costs so little, it is economically feasible to keep poking holes in the planet and taking stuff out and setting it on fire to light our buildings and move our vehicles forward. And until we move past that, we're not going to get out of this mess. And we need to change the economics. As long as it is cheap enough to do that, we will continue to do it. I don't care how you vote. We will continue to do it. 
the high cost of cheap energy. It looks like energy from heaven is more expensive than energy from hell, only if you ignore all of the costs. We need to fix the accounting error. We need to pay for this, little by little, and we can. What if we do that by collecting a fee at the point of extraction? It'll increase prices of everything, but give the money back to you. A fee and dividend. Yes, some people call this a carbon tax. George Schultz, who helped write this plan, says you shouldn't call it a tax if the government doesn't keep it. So if we collect this money and we give the money back to you and it helps you make choices when you go to purchase, and by the way, you're not making some, some nerdy carbon choice by looking at a, at a carbon footprint label on the side and making some sort of scientific choice. You're making the choice by the price tag because the number the price would reflect its carbon footprint against a like item that might have a higher price because it was created with a higher carbon footprint less efficiently. And there you're changing the markets and you then are making these choices. Um, I hope that you'll have time because I do have to pull off in a minute. Uh, oh, I have one minute? No, not even. So I'm going to wrap it. Uh, there is a video you can watch out there that will help explain this. I'm just going to show you that if you want to be part of this, talk to Dr. John Van Leer. Put your hand up, Dr. John Van Leer. Uh, we have some paperwork and some information to share with you all on how you can be part of Citizens Climate Lobby. We are moving the needle. We go to lawmakers in Washington, D.C., and we're creating political will for a livable world, and I hope that you will be a part of this movement. We are thousands strong. The Miami chapter is small and growing with your help, but we have been called the most important chapter in the nation because we are politically significant in Florida and we're geographically significant as well. And we have done amazing work in engaging our lawmakers. We have... Um, Carlos Carbello is on board, Eliana ross Layton is on board, and just most recently, what has happened is a bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus was created. This is amazing. Republicans and Democrats working together to work on climate. And this is a Republican from Tampa who just signed the Gibson Climate Resolution that I told you about a moment ago. So these are Republicans that we're bringing over to get real and, and don't make this a partisan issue. Bring them over, give them a seat at the table, and make them help them and your parents become part of the solution. You need to vote and you need to use your voice to build political will. So thank you very much, everybody. There's more information. And I'm gonna give you information on how you can call in and learn more about CCL online, all right? Be, be the change you wanna see in the world.